My name is Eric. I am the pastor, lead pastor here at Shoreline. Just want to welcome you this morning. And I also want to welcome those watching online. Pastor AG is your moderator. He's on there. He'll take care of you. So excited. I, you know, maybe this has happened to you, but when, uh, when I first became a Christ follower, this is years, this is the 80s, okay? Uh, so I was a sailmaker when I became a Christian. So I made sails for sailboats. And I used to race a lot of sailboats. And um, I had just become a Christ follower. I think it was around March or April. And in July, we had to go to the we had to go to the Bahamas uh, for work and race boats. It's called Regatta Time in Abaco. It's about two weeks of racing, and so I remember we rented a house. We took sailed the boat over there. And some guys flew in. We're gonna do two weeks of racing. We rented a house on Elbow Key, and one of the nights, my buddies were like, "Eric, we're going into Marsh Harbor, which is an eight mile boat ride. It's not just like jump over there. We're going to Marsh Harbor. Come on, we're gonna go party. There's a big party there." And I'm like, "No, I'm going to stay and read my Bible." All right. So this is, I'm trying, you know, I'm trying to turn over a new leaf. I've become a Christ follower, but I've come out of this party world. And they were, come on, Eric, come on, Eric. And then finally one of them goes, um, you know, the Bible doesn't say you can't drink. It just says to not get drunk. Even the devil knows scripture, right? <laughs> and I was like, okay, you had me at uh, <laughs> the Bible doesn't say, right? So uh, again, it was almost impossible to go out for one drink because it's eight miles away. You have to take a boat over there. But to if I, I don't have time to tell you exactly what happened, but if I could quote one of our more modern day poets, Morgan Wallen, um, if I see the sunrise, it's because I stayed up all night. That's ended up what happened. I don't know if that's ever happened to you where you're trying to turn over a new leaf. Um, you're trying to change your life, uh, you know, d do something good, get, lose weight, uh, quit drinking, you know, spend more time fa with your family or less time watching TV and reading or whatever. And then somebody or someone or something comes along and tries to throw you off track. In fact, I, I remember being clean for a whole year. In fact, I'll just, can I be honest with you? I've been clean for this whole last year. And then I walk into local market this week, and there's those darn Girl Scouts selling their crack right there at the door, and I can't walk out of there without buying five boxes of cookies. It was for a good cause, all right? <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It's like, you go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn over, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to do this, and then somebody talks you out of it, or some distraction comes along, or whatever it is, and then you wind up, you know, not doing it. And it can be, again, it can be as, as, uh, Simple as trying to lose weight, and it can be as important or significant as the vision or dream for your life. Well, last week, we looked at a man who was broken for his hometown of Jerusalem. It was a city that he'd probably never been to, and what had happened was, well, I'll, I'll get into what happened, but he, he hears stories about Jerusalem. The walls are in rubble. The temple's been torn down. The economy is horrible. People there are struggling, and his heart is broken. I mean, his heart, is, he, he, his heart is so broken that he had to do something about it, and he becomes a man with a mission. And he goes back to Jerusalem, and the very same thing that might have happened to you that happened to me in the Bahamas happens to him. He has a dream or a vision of what could be and what should be, and over and over and over, he gets distracted and gets to, tempted to choose his own way over God's way. And so what I want to do is I believe this story can help us. So this is the last talk this month in this series we're calling God's Way. And so let me give you a little recap in case you weren't here last week when we talked about Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a story in the Old Testament. He's a, it's actually a book in the Old Testament. And Nehemiah lived around 444 BC in the time of this guy, man named Artaxerxes. He's the king of Persia. Now, the capital of Persia was a city called Susa, and Nehemiah was actually a cupbearer to the king. So he is trusted by this king. In fact, he's become more than a cupbearer. He's become a friend. And so Nehemiah is a Jewish man, probably never been in, Jer in Jerusalem ever before because he was born in captivity and never been to Israel, never been back to his own roots. But he is overcome because Jerusalem had actually been destroyed 100 years before this by the Babylonian Empire under the name of King uh, Nebuchadnezzar. You've probably heard of that before. Even if you're not a Christian, you might have heard of that name. Nebuchadnezzar goes in, destroys Jerusalem, takes a lot of people captive and brings them back to Babylon. Then, some years later, Babylon is then conquered by Persia. So now Persia runs the whole Middle Eastern area. And now there's lots of Jews living there. So this king of Persia says, well, I don't know where all these Jews came from. So he says, he puts out this proclamation, says, if you were taken, captivity, taken captive and brought back here and you want to go home, I'm giving you permission to go home. 
So many of these Jews begin to go back to Jerusalem, but Jerusalem is in ruins. The temple is destroyed. The walls are torn down. Uh, it's just, a, it's, the economy is in shambles. And so Nehemiah gets some words from people that had gone back to Jerusalem. He thinks, he's going, how's it going? Is the city, is it, is it prospering again? Do we have a temple worship? Is the economy going? And they're like, no, it's horrible. Um, it's, it's really bad. The walls are still torn down. The gates are uh, uh, destroyed. The temple isn't up and running. So Nehemiah gets moved by this thing and he prays this prayer. And we looked at this prayer last week. I actually asked you to pray it. And he says, Lord, give ears to the prayer of your servant and give me favor and make my way successful with this man. He's talking about the king because he knows he has a job working for the most powerful man in the world that if he can get access or entrance to the king that he could probably... Anyway, so that's what he prays for. So one day he's in there working, serving the king. His face is very, de he's very depressed. So you could see it on his face. So the king says, what, why so blue, panda bear? And he's like, well, I told you they become friends. He says, well, I, it's hard for me to be happy knowing that the city of my forefathers, the city of my ancestors lies in ruins. So I was hoping that I could take some time off to go back and rebuild the city. Now, remember, he didn't work for the king. He was a slave. Slaves don't ask for time off. But the king says, because remember he prayed this prayer for favor with the king. The king says, yes, and not only can you have time off, better yet, I'm going to make you the governor of Jerusalem. That way I can supply you with letters. Uh, I can give you everything that you need to help you rebuild the wall. So Nehemiah and his entourage, they head back to Jerusalem uh, with all of, his, all of his supplies and the vision to restore this great, once great city, <laughs> I think of a slogan for it, make Jerusalem great again. I don't know. The, the, that was his slogan, make Jerusalem great again. He's like, it's going to be huge. We're going to rebuild the wall. It's going to be huge. <laughs> and we're going to make the Syrians pay for it, okay? All right. <laughs> that just came to me. I didn't do it in the first service. You guys are privy to that, right? So... Anyway, so he goes back with the, <laughs> the vision to restore the walls. Now, the walls have been torn down for years, and the surrounding area was ruled by powerful warlords who had their way with Jerusalem because with no walls and no, no gates, no, you know, there was, they could just show up and do anything they want. So really, Jerusalem had become their own personal booty call. They were like, hey, Jerusalem, what are you doing? Well, I'm about to go to bed while I'm down at the gates. How about it, right? I know that's so inappropriate, isn't it? I'm, they call me Michael Scott here at the work because I say the things. They're like, Pastor Eric, you can't say those things. So anyway... Jerusalem is these guys' booty call. Dr Nehemiah shows up and he goes out and he starts inspecting the city right away at night so nobody even knows what he's doing. I mean, there are so many things wrong on so many different levels. The walls are torn down. The gates have been burned. The temple is destroyed. The economy is in shambles. And so there's so much, and I don't know if you've ever been, you've got a task at hand and there's so, much, so many things that have to be done. You go, okay, I'm just gonna focus on this one thing for right now. And so that's what Nehemiah does. He says, if I only get one thing done, I wanna get these, re these walls rebuilt. And so he starts the rebuilding of these walls and he makes progress really fast. So fast that those warlords from the region, they start to get ner nervous, okay? Because if he gets these walls rebuilt, their meal ticket's gone. And so uh, the leader of these, these, these warlords is a guy named Sanballat. And again, Sanballat and his cronies, they don't want this to happen. So he sends spies into the city to infiltrate Nehemiah's group that are rebuilding the walls, hopefully that he can cause division and dissent. And that doesn't work. So he comes up with another plan and he sends, he sends, uh, he basically threatens violence. Like if you guys keep building the walls, we're gonna kill you. So Nehemiah, incredible man of vision, great story. If you've never read the book, I encourage you to read it because not only is it a, a, a book about vision and how to carry out vision, but also how to make plans and how to change plans. Because when you have a vision and you start going after it, there are gonna be things that distract you. There's gonna be plans that come, uh, things that come up and you're gonna have to change plans. And so Nehemiah comes up with a plan for every person working on the wall. There's somebody standing on the wall with a spear or sword. In fact, he has most of the guys who have a, he says they have a, a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. And so that doesn't work. And so pretty soon with all of their hard work and their diligence, the walls are almost complete. So Sambalot has one more plan and he tries to distract Nehemiah so they can kill him. And that's where we're gonna pick up our story in chapter six of Nehemiah. And if you, again, it's gonna be on the screen, but if you wanna pull out the app, and oh, oh, if you haven't downloaded our app, I encourage you to download the app, but all of this is on the app so that you can follow along with these notes. 
Okay, so Nehemiah chapter six, verse one, here's what it says. When word came to Sambalot, that's one of his enemies, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time, I had not set the doors and the gates. So it gets back to Sanballat and his cronies that they're almost done with the, with the walls. All they have to do left is the gates and the doors. They get, their, they get those things up and that's it. Their, their meal ticket's over. They're no longer gonna have their way to, with Jerusalem. So Nehem, they send this letter to Nehemiah, all right? And now remember, these are the Nehemiah's enemies. And here's what the letter says. Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come. Let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of, oh no, but they were scheming to harm me. So this is an invitation to meet for lunch. You know, hey, hey, I see what you're doing. Uh, the walls are being real boat. Let's get together, have your people call mine. But what they planned to do was they planned to get him alone and to kill him and be, without a leader, then the work would fall apart. And Nehemiah answers him. And this is what I wanna look at, this answer, because in this answer is the power, it contains the power for whatever you, the motivation that you need, the motivation that I need, the motivation that he needed to carry out that dream, no matter what happens, no matter the obstacles you face. He's, here's what he answers to them, because they want to meet lunch. So he says, I sent messengers to them with this reply. I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave and come down to you? And I love his reply. I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. I'm doing a great work and I cannot. In fact, can we just read this together as a whole church? Let's just read this together. I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Let's, let's do it again, but I want to emphasize the word great work. Okay, you ready? We're going to put the emphasis on the great work. I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. And this time, let's, let's emphasize cannot. I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Kind of like Brady Bunch. Hark, the herald, uh, hark, who goes there? Or is it hark, who goes there? Anybody, Brady Bunch? No? Okay. <laughs> Here's the point. The point, this answer is incredible because Nehemiah knew that what he was doing was a God thing. Nehemiah knew that he was, it was an important thing. It was a great work and he didn't have time for a meeting. Nehemiah knew he couldn't allow himself to be distracted from this great work. He knew that this was a thing that God had called him to do, and he had to stay laser focused. He was not going to let up, and he was going to be relentless about what God had called him to do. Now, if you look at it on the surface, taking a meeting or a dinner or lunch with Sambalot, that's not a bad thing. Making peace with an enemy is usually a good idea. But Nehemiah knew that God had called him to rebuild the wall, and he looked at this opportunity as a distraction. And it was a good thing, too, because Sambalot had no intention of making peace. He was, gonna, he was trying to kill Nehemiah. Now, every day of your life and every day of my life, opportunities come along that have the potential to distract us from the main things that God has called us to do. And the, the opportunities are endless. Entertainment opportunities, sports, sports for your kids, uh, relationship opportunities, even religious or church opportunities, career, invest, uh, career investments, all kinds of opportunities. The list is endless. And I know in my world, it is endless. I could be out every, in fact, in my world, the greatest, the opportunities with the greatest potential to distract me from what God has called me to do are actually good things, things that I can justify. Planning meetings and counseling and speaking engagements here and there, and community functions and conferences. I mean, I, do you know how many people want to have dinner with me? I'm kind of a big deal, all right? My, my office smells like rich mahogany and leather-bound books, so I'm kind of a, no, I'm just kidding, but you know what? If I wanted to, I could distract myself with opportunities every night, six night, night, nights of the week, and be even busier than I already am, but not making any progress to achieve what God has called me to achieve. When we were youth pastors, we knew that our mandate 
was to, we, our youth ministry was pretty good size, but there was a guy down the street that was blowing it out even more than us. But we knew one of our mandates was to rate, reach and raise up next generation leaders that God had given us influence with. And some of these teenagers that were in our youth ministry are now pastors and worship leaders and business leaders and some doctors all over the world, all over the country. And then we knew that he called us to come back to our hometown of Destin and plant a church for people who don't like church. And now our mandate is to bring the next generation to him, the next generation of children, the next generation of students, the next generation of young adults, as well as the next generation of leaders in this church and churches that God has given us influence with around the country. So this is a, this is a good work. This is a great work that we're doing and I cannot come down. This is a great work that God has called us to do in this community. We cannot come down and to accomplish some of the most important things or the most important things that God has put before us means sometimes we have to say no to some good things because more often than not, it's the good things that have the potential to distract us from the best things. It's the good things that have the potential to distract us from the God things and the vision things. If Nehemiah had accepted Sambalot's invitation, his enemies would have killed him. For you, and listen, for, for you, for me, there are hobbies, there's relationships, there's appointments, there's all kinds of things. And if anyone's susceptible to that, it's me. Because, you know, that's why we're hosting the fly fishing film tour. Because I like fly fishing and I get addicted to something, but I try to use it, everything, I try to use it as a tool. It's a tool to reach people and it's a tool to help our environment. But if we allow those things, they can kill our chances of accomplishing the main thing that God has called us to accomplish. So verse four, here's his reply. He says, four times they sent me this same message and each time I gave them the same answer. So every time they invited him off the wall, every time he, they did that, he said, I can't do it. The work that I have before me is too important. The work that I have before me is too great. It's a God work and I cannot come down. So we can't allow the, the, the opportunities, good opportunities to distract us from what God's called us to do. So dads, when you're tucking your children in at night, you just have to whisper to yourself, I'm doing a good work. I cannot come down. You know, with a, when you're tempted to call your wife and say you won't be home for dinner again because you've got to work late. Maybe at that point, you need to put the phone down, pick up your keys and say, I'm doing a good work. I cannot come down and go home and tuck your children in. Ladies, moms, when you're tempted to add another good opportunity into your, already fa your family's already stuffed schedule. Maybe that's the time that you say, no, I'm doing a work. I cannot come down. If you're single, if you're single, you can't get distracted from the vision of, because remember what we talked about vision is? Vision is, this is, you look at something as how it looks right now, and this is what it could be or should be. See, that's vision. Vision is seeing how something is now and what it could be and should be. And so maybe you're a single uh, adult here, and maybe the vision that you have for your Mary of your future of what it could be and should be, you know, allowing right now you're having to allow God to shape your character while you wait for the person that you're supposed to be with. It's a great work, but it's easy to get distracted, just like me in the Bahamas. Come on, man. And maybe you have to say, no, I'm too busy to come down. This is a good work. I've seen people who, are, who their vision is to be out of debt, but they get distracted by the, uh, you know, the allurement of more stuff. I've seen something as simple as a boat distract men and women, families from their potential. I've seen a, I've seen, I've seen a family that God was changing their life and their business blew up and they just, church fell out of the bed, you know, God kind of fell out of the rearview mirror. I've seen many Christians catch a vision for reaching their friends and their family and their neighbors who are far from God. And then they allow hobbies or other distractions or forms of entertainment to distract them for, for every dream, every vision that you have, everything that you wanna do in your life. There are dozens of distractions that are meant to derail you. So we have to be careful that we don't allow good opportunities to rob us the joy of seeing what God has called us to do become a reality. So let's get back to the story. So. When all of these things don't work, what Sambalot starts a rumor. And the rumor is that once Nehemiah finishes the walls and the gates, he's going to establish his own kingdom 
and he's going to rebel against the king of Persia. And what they think will happen is that Nehemiah will hear this rumor, get scared, head back to Susa and plead for his life. And remember, this, when you go, oh, I'm just running back to Susa. That wasn't a three-day journey. It's not like running up to Atlanta. It took, Nehemiah, when he asked for time off to go rebuild the walls, he says, hey, can I have a little time to go rebuild the walls? He was there 12 years. So to run back to Susa would be a six-month endeavor. And they knew if we could get him out of there and he goes back because he's pleading for his life, that we can stop the, the buildings of the wall. In fact, here's what they say. Verse five says, then the fifth time. So they sent four times. They said, let's meet. He says, no. The fifth time, Sambalot sent his aid to me with the same message. And in his hand was an unsealed letter, which was written. It, is import, it was reported among the nations. And Geshem says it's true. You know, everyone says this. And you know who else says it's true, right? Geshem says it's true that you and the Jews are plotting, plotting to revolt. And therefore, that's why you're building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you're about to become their king and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There's a king in Judah. That's what they would do. They would have a prophet declare, long live the king. Now this report will get back to the king. So come, let's meet together. Now in those days, letters were written on leather or papyrus and then they were rolled up, right? And then they would usually be tied with a string. And then the person sending it would melt wax on it and then seal it with his ring so that nobody would read it. But he purposely left this one open. And the reason was because that, th thinking that everybody who carried this letter would read that Nehemiah is rebelling against the king and is going to rebel. So, of course, nothing could be further from the truth. But, you know, since when did we let the truth distract us? I mean... We see that in our culture all the time, right? People are only in the truth that supports their agenda. If it doesn't support their agenda, you're right. But see, Nehemiah, if word got out to Nehemiah that he was laying the groundwork to declare himself king, hey, I've already heard that you've lined up prophets to declare yourself king. He'd find himself back at Susa with a rope around his neck. But once again, it doesn't move Nehemiah. Once again, he is not distracted. Once again, he's got laser focus on the task at hand. In fact, let's skip on down for the sake of time, to verse 15. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. 52 days. William Wallace killed 50, man. I can't say 50 without hearing that. 52 days. And again, I said this last week, it took him four years to widen 98, and it takes him 52 days to finish the Jerusalem, right? When all of our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. So again, like I said last week, no miracles, you know, no elves showed up at night and built the walls while they slept. There was no, you know, extreme makeover, move that camel, all right? None of that. But because of their hard work, because of their determination, to complete this, gate work, this great work and not let the distractions distract them, you know, to get them off the wall. When they finished, everyone goes, that's God. They finished those walls in 52 days. That is God. Now, here's the point of this talk. I've got 10 minutes left. We cannot get distracted. We cannot let good opportunities distract us. We cannot let criticism you know, when we came here to start this church, I said we came here with the focus of starting a church for people who don't like church. And if you don't think we got any criticism for it, you're mistaken. Wait a minute. What do you mean you have a slide in your church or a salon or whatever it is? But we can't allow those things. We can't allow fear to distract us. Oh, what are you going to do? To keep our, we have to keep our eyes on the, on the finish line because we have a great work and we cannot come down. Now, everybody ends up somewhere in life. You're going to end up somewhere in life. Nehemiah ended some, up somewhere on purpose. And we too have those same opportunities. Nehemiah believed what could be and should be. And he believed it so much that he put all his work behind it. And it eventually became a reality. And the people responded to his call for not only rebuilding the walls, but spiritual reform and social reform. Because the temple became operative. They brought the priests back in. They brought the Levites back in. They started worshiping. They did word. They started tithing again. And they never lost sight of their destiny. And just like Nehemiah, 
every one of us in this room, everyone watching online, we have a destiny to fulfill. And God has placed before us responsibilities and opportunities that are overflowing with significance. He's given you talents. He's given us gifts that he's waiting for us to use. But as Nehemiah's story illustrates, it takes more than vision. It takes more than imagination. It takes more than just passion. It takes more than just dreaming of what could be and should be. A dream requires more than just a one-time visit from God. It requires vision. It requires hard work. It requires determination. It requires focus. It requires being able to say no to the good things sometimes in order to say yes to the God things. Now, this actually has application both corporately as a church and application for us personally. So I want to tackle the church thing. What does this mean for the church? Well, I've talked about this for the last two weeks. I said, this is our initiative season. This is the, this is the time of the year. In fact, if you're here this morning, you're like, every, I don't like church because every time I go to church, they just ask for money. Well, then you came on the wrong day. All right. I'm like, and, and listen, if that happens, every time you go to church, they ask for money and you don't go to church that often, God's got your number about something, okay? He's probably trying to deal with you. You probably like your money too much. He's like, hey, it's not me, it's you, right? It's not me, it's you, right? So the initiatives are basically things that we want to accomplish this year in order to fulfill what God has called us to do as a church. And so there's four areas, we got a little graphic, that we're gonna do this. In our home, our that's our church, this building right here, because that's an important part of what God called us to do, our community, our nation, and our world. And I love this graphic. Graham came up with this. And the reason why I love it is because, see, the our world, we're, all of that is contained in God's global story. God has been writing a story for thousands of years. And right now, we're a part of that story. And we're a part of that story, not just in the community or in our nation, but it has global significance. Darling used this phrase. I really loved it. She said that the the city of Destin breathes in, or this community, not just Destin, Fort Walton, everywhere. The city, this area breathes in and it breathes out. It breathes people in through the military and then breathes them out to the world. It breathes tourists who come to enjoy our beautiful natural resources and then breathes them out. So the significance that we have as a city isn't just, uh, or the, the, the opportunities that we have as a, as a community isn't just for our community. It's for the whole world. So we want to look at these initiatives, and we're going to start with our home. When I say our home, this is our church. And so you've been hearing a lot, of, a lot of us say this. You heard it this morning. we got to make room. That's our call right now. Oh, and by the way, you've got these, uh, if you want to follow along with these initiatives, they're on your seat. I'm not going to just go into them in detail, so i take this opportunity to look at them. So the first one is our community. It's our home. I mean, see, our, our home. And look at this. I mean, there's hardly any seats left here. Third service is, I mean, it's just getting that way. And we've got Easter coming up. And Easter, you can expect in the church world, your attendance doubles on Easter. So what are we going to do? We're going to have large crowds added to our already large crowds. Well, we have two initiatives. Our immediate goals include necessary audio and visual production upgrades. We've had this wall for eight years. It's starting to have some problems. We've talked to the technicians. We need some audio upgrades. So we want to get, because you always want to put your best foot out for Easter, right? So that's one of them. Another need you're going to see is a temporary expansion for our children's ministry because our children's ministry is full. And we've talked about this for the last couple of weeks. We don't ever, I never want to send people away. I mean, I'd rather get arrested for violating fire codes and letting people meet Jesus. I'd rather tear the roof off a ceiling and lower people down to see Jesus than to turn people away. Because hell is inviting people at a rapid pace. And so we're never gonna do that. Now we know we have to do something more permanent with our children's ministry. We don't know what that looks like yet. So, but for Easter, we've gotta do some temporary. We're, th we're looking at bringing portable buildings in, whatever we can do. And it's only, but it's through above and beyond generosity that allows for this ongoing expansion and so that we can begin transformation into our generation. So that's Easter. We also have some non-monetary or giving needs for Easter because you're probably thinking, well, Eric, where are we going to put people if our attendance is going to double? Just so you know, because Easter's a month away, we are adding a Saturday night service, possibly two Saturday night services. And we're adding a 1030 service at AJ's. So for all you sinners, you want to enjoy a mimosa or a Bloody Mary while you're at church, then you go down to AJ's. And by the way, Alan Laird tells me that 
they sell more mimosas and Bloody Marys on Easter service, Easter than any other week of the year. So they're like, are y'all doing church again this year? And we're like, yeah, we'll be there. (laughs) So here's what this means. We need people to man the walls or pull in the nets or whatever metaphor you want to use. So here's, here's, I'm throwing out, you're going to hear more about this this month. If you're already on a serve team, here's what we want you to do. If you're already serving somewhere on a Sunday and you don't bring anybody to Sunday, you don't bring, nobody's coming with you to church on Easter, we're asking you to attend on Saturday night and serve Sunday morning, okay? Now, if you're here this morning and you're not on a serve team, you're going to hear more about this next week. But what we want to do is we want you to get on a serve team. We're going to train you for the month of March so that Easter you can serve on Saturday night. So all those people who serve in the kids ministry can come in here and get ministry on Saturday night and you can serve and then you can attend on Sunday morning. So we are going to be making that ask. I'm just letting you know, okay? Making that ask, all right? We're going to be making that ask. (laughs) And then of course, now's the time to start inviting. In fact, I would even go far as to say if you are a regular attender and you don't have anybody coming on Sunday, I would attend one of the lesser service like 8.30 or 11.30 or Saturday night because we've got to, you know, just like you make room for your guests at home, you kick your kids, make them sleep together when grandma and grandpa come over and get their bedroom, right? That's what we do. We're going to make y'all sleep together while we give somebody else some seats. So, but here, let me, but we're not going to not invite. I will never stand up here and tell you, oh, don't invite anymore. We're too full. So I'm telling you to invite, and I want to give you some hints how to do it. It's really easy. We'll probably have some invite cards, but people right now, Easter's coming up. We're going to roll into March. If they get an invitation to church, they'll go, because a lot of people just go on Christmas and Easter. And like I said, it's a bummer because they see Jesus die, and three, or born, and three months later, he dies. And like, there's a whole lot between there if you want to come on the other times. But here's how you invite, okay? And then you invite this way. Um, you look for the three knots, okay? We call them the three knots. Not in church, not doing well, not prepared for. Oh, we just moved to the area. We're not in church. Or, or my father passed away and just last week, we're not doing well. Or we just had a baby. We were just not prepared for that. And here's your response. Oh my gosh, our church is talking about exactly that at Easter. You go, Eric, are we talking about that? That doesn't matter. Whatever it takes. <laughs> if you have to lie to lead people to Jesus, it's okay. Jesus goes, that's all right, you know. We used to say this, we'll do whatever it takes short of sin. And then we're like, all right, maybe, yeah, we won't sin, okay, to bring people to Jesus. That's what you do, and just invite them, invite them, okay? Next is our community, and that's talk, we're loving our neighbors. That's a big, we're actually starting a series next week called Love Your Neighbor. That's a big thing for us. So we're gonna continue, you see, one of our initiatives, one of the things that we've been doing is Shoreline Grub Club, where we feed the people local lunches down to the local workers on the harbor and the beaches, the lifeguards out Crab Island. We feed them, okay? In fact, I told you the story. There's a guy coming. He might be here today where he said the first time he came was in January and he decided to get, you know, start a new leaf, turn over a new leaf, start a new life and, you know, new, new year, new life. And he said, where am I going to go? I'm going to go to the church that fed me all summer. So he's here. So it has an impact. Remember, we're breathing life into the city we love. The other initiative is church at Crab Island. Now, Church at Crab Island evolved out of COVID before people wanted to get back in the building, okay? So we're, one of our goals is to impact lives with intentionality and connect like never before. So our slogan, making a difference in the city we love, isn't just a slogan. It's a lifestyle. It's what we do. Now, let me tell you, Church at Crab Island may look a little different this year. And the reason is because everything that we do, we are always doing what we call check and adjust. We want to make sure that the way we're doing anything is the most effective. So we are looking at Church of Crab Island right now saying, is this the most effective way to do things out there? So it may look different because here's what we say. We're married to the mission, not the method. Okay? Now, I was going to say we're married to the mission, not the model, but I'm married to a model, so I couldn't say that. No, you are. (laughs) We're married to the mission, not the method. The methods change. That's why this church is so effective, because it's a different method of doing something that we've done a long time. Remember what Jesus said? Hey, I know you've been doing church this way, Peter, but why don't you let down your nets for a catch? Okay, I'm going to do it different. And look what God has done, all right? So it may look a little different, but but it's going to be the same mission. All right, and then nationally, our mandate is to strengthen leaders, strengthening leaders. When we encourage 
pastors around the nation, we are investing not only in them, but the communities that they, are, uh, that they lead. And because of my age and my experience, that has led us to be po- uniquely positioned to, that, to uh, share what God has shown us throughout the years of ministry. And so with, with this next generation of ministry leaders, many of them are students that grew up through our youth ministry that are now pastors, and they're now fulfilling the Great Commission. So we host creative experiences where we focus on relationship, uh, collaboration, discipleship, and our goal is to build momentum and strategy for them to go and plant a church. I've got a young man right now that I'm talking to. He wants to plant a shoreline in Navarre. Now, it's only in the dream stage, and I can't even tell you who it is. But that's what God has called us to do, is to to bring those dreamers, those people who have a dream, something that they can't escape from, the Nehemiahs of our culture, and help them in that direction and help them get over those distractions. But not only to go, but to stay. Sometimes you get there and like Sanballat, Nehemiah's enemy, you get into a city and it becomes hard and difficult and we encourage them to, you know, that's what happens when we do this, all right? So that's national. And then our last one is our global initiatives. That's where we're building dreams. And now we have a lot of, we have different partners in, throughout India, Nepal, Indonesia. Those are some of the places that this, uh, and this one, these two initiatives, we're focusing on some partnerships that we've had long-term relationships with, and we have done multiple phases with them. And they have some phases that they want to uh, accomplish. And so that's what's in front of us. And because of those projects and the mission of leading young people to know Jesus through three things, education, discipleship, and you're not going to believe the last one, recreation. You want to reach the students and the children of the world, you play soccer or skateboarding or surfing or some form of recreation that gives them that connection. And then through discipleship and education, we can change the world. That's what's happening in Uganda. Uganda is going to be a different country in 20 years because of the impact that not only us, but One Hope and other organizations that are making there. And what we're, they're doing is they're starting with the children. And you change that generation of children into leaders, and I'm, my gosh, you're going to change a country. And so uh, our section of the wall for this, this season are those two areas, Uganda and Indonesia. Because listen, God's, God's mandate to us in 2022 was to bring the children to me. If you have, I'll, I'll have to tell you that story. I've told it before, but we'll refer you back to the message. But he said, bring the, bring the children to me. And that's still our mandate. And right now, we don't know what we're going to do with our children's ministry. We're asking God, God, we've got to do something. What do you have for us? Where should we let down our nets? But we believe that if we will partner with our partners on the other parts of the world and reach their children, what we're doing is we're sowing into the children of the world, and we are going to reap here at home. Okay, so we may not know what to do with our children yet, but we're not going to not do nothing. We're going to continue to bring the children to us, to Jesus. And that's what tonight is about. Heart and soul, starting at six o'clock. We're going to have some worship. We're going to come with our gifts. We're going to come. We're going to pray. We're going to believe what God has. We're going to believe the mission. We're going to stay focused on what the mission. Tonight is the night that we say, I'm all in. Tonight is the night, night we say, I'm ready for a faith adventure. Tonight is the night we say, yes to God. And we're going to come with our prayers, and we're going to come with our commitments. Now, let me close with this. That's corporately. What about you personally? What is the dream that you can't shake? What keeps you up at night? What is it that breaks your heart? What is it that you just know that you cannot afford to be distracted from, that you can't come down off the wall? Maybe you're a student, and it's finishing school to finish school well. Maybe it's to get that college scholarship. I mean, it could be anything, but what is it that you cannot afford to come down off the wall? Again, maybe you're a young adult, and maybe for you, it's allowing God to shape your character while he brings that person that you're going to spend the rest of your life with. And it's hard waiting, but it's good work, and you cannot be distracted from the plan. You can't afford to come down. Maybe you're married, and you're figuring out that marriage is hard work, (laughs) right? And sometimes you just want to throw in the towel. Because remember, God's way is always harder. My way is so much easier. My way feels so much better. And maybe that's you and you have to go, look, it's a good work. I cannot afford to come down. Maybe just, we've talked about this, raising your kids in this culture. 
It's like they just want to erase all your values and standards that you want to instill in them. And it's harder and harder and harder to fight that because culture is racing to get to their hearts first. It's a good work. You cannot come down. Maybe it's the business you want to start. Maybe you want to get out of debt so that you can be more generous. Maybe it's an addiction that you need to get over or you need to stop drinking. Whatever, you, maybe it's what you believe your purpose is. Maybe that God has put something in your heart that you cannot shake. Your heart is broken for something. Like me, 35 years ago, trying to go the right way, go God's way, whatever it is. I'm doing a good work. I cannot come down. And I love what Nehemiah said. When things got tough, this is the last scripture we're going to look at. Here's what he said in chapter 4, verse 14. He said, oh, I didn't put the scripture on here. Do we have it up there? There you go. That's why. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, fight for your sons, fight for your daughters and your wives and your homes. See, that's what it's all about. It's about, a, it's about the next generation. We're focusing on our sons and our daughters and our grandchildren and even kids who aren't even uh, here yet, even kids, people who aren't even born. So we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to make the sacrifice? So here's what we've done for you. Everyone who leaves is gonna get this band. We have wristband for everybody. And it says, I'm not coming down. So every time that you're tempted you know, maybe you're taking care of a parent and it's such hard work and it's two years and you're like, I don't know how much I can do it. I'm not coming down. It's a good work. I'm not coming down. Maybe it is raising kids. Maybe, maybe you're, you're trying to do something and all you get is criticism. Everyone's shooting down your ideas. Maybe you're in politics. Maybe you're one of the city councilmen and you're trying to do good for our area and people just criticize you and you feel like quitting. And look at this wristband and say, no, I'm doing a great work. I'm not coming down. Maybe it is to stop drinking. Maybe it is to go into ministry. Maybe, maybe your dream is to work on the mission field. But all you see is obstacles. I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. Maybe your marriage is on the verge and both of you have given up working on it. Maybe you need to come together and say, I'm, it's good work. I'm not coming down. Because what we have is too important. But God has given us the opportunities. We can't come down as a church and as individuals. We cannot not be a part. God's global story is so important and we are part of that. And so is your personal life. We cannot come down. So I invite you tonight to come tonight. Just and come here and be a part of what God is doing individually as well as corporately as a church. Let's pray. God, we believed like Nehemiah that you have strategic purposes and plans for us individually, for us as a church, and that we are part of one big story that started thousands of years ago and you're continuing to write it. And not only are we a part of it in this building, but we're part of this in our community that has a ripple effect that goes to the world. God, we choose to be focused on the main thing. We choose to focus on the good work that you've called us to do, both corporately and personally. And Lord, may this be a reminder all year long. I'm doing a good work. I cannot come down. In Jesus' name, amen.